Central Illinois is home to Chautauqua National Wildlife Refuge and Amaquan National Wildlife Refuge, two of the best sites in Illinois for shorebird and waterfowl birding, including the Limpkin and the Rosette Spoonbill. Our September speaker is Joshua Osborne, the Waterbird Ecology Facilities Manager at the Forbes Biological Station in Havana, Illinois. Josh's research interests include wetland and water bird ecology, focusing on habitat management at mid-migration and southern latitudes in particular. The focus of his presentation will be on the work being done at the Forest Biological Station and both the National Wildlife Refuges, including the FBS Aerial Waterfowl Inventory along the Illinois and Central Mississippi rivers. So with that, let me hand it over to our speaker tonight, Mr. Josh Osborne. Now stick by me, please. So hopefully Mike hadn't got all the problems out of the way. Yeah. Because I am not the most technologically advanced person in the world. But we're going to give her a go here. Can, can everyone in Zoom land see that? I think so. Yes. Yes. All right. So thanks, Mike. Thanks everybody for having me here. Um, I'm I'm glad to to uh, tell you guys a little bit about some of the work that we do at the Forbes Biological Station. My name is Josh Osborne. Um, if you if you um, kind of hear a small tinge of Southern accent, that's because I'm not originally from Illinois. I'm from Mississippi originally. We, uh, my wife and I, have lived here for about ten years now. Um, so if, if I draw out an O or an A or something, just ask me to, to <laughs> restate what I said. I'm glad to do it. Um, there it goes. So like Mike said, um, I'm a, I'm a water bird and waterfowl ecologist. Uh, we, we do mostly water, waterfowl work. Uh, although our new director, uh, Ariel Furnier, who's been there a, a few years, probably about four years now, she's more of a rail specialist. Um, so we, we've been able to diversify a little bit in some of the, some of the birds that we do. We, we have been doing long-term uh, marsh bird projects. So we haven't always solely been a waterfowl um, research station, but that's kind of, uh, kind of our bread and butter, really, if you will. Um, we're located at the very southeast corner of Chautauqua National Wildlife Refuge on uh, actually on uh, Fish and Wildlife property. It's kind of this cool little um, old deed, uh, old agreement that was come to years ago. So although we're uh, university kind of affiliated, um, we're, we operate within the uh, umbrella of the Prairie Research Institute, which is kind of a research arm of the University of Illinois. Um, we, we're actually located on fish and wildlife property. Um, we're the oldest inland field station in North America. That's something that we're pretty proud of. And as a facilities manager, is something that I stay pretty frustrated with because our building is pretty old and most of our gear is relatively old. Um, I'd be remiss if I started any of these without talking about a couple of our previous directors. Uh, Frank Belrose was the was kind of the the spearhead of our operation. Frank started his work in the 30s. Um, and if, if any of you guys know anything about Frank Belrose, it, um, he's kind of one of the, the seminal names in, in uh, waterfowl ecology. Uh, he's what most waterfowl students, uh, the, the name that they hear first. Um, Frank is, is probably the reason that we have the wood duck today. Uh, his wood duck box, which was kind of his brainchild, um, helped bring, bring the wood duck, wood duck back from the brink. And most of that research was done along Pool 19 of the Mississippi River in Nauvoo, or at least that's where it started. Frank wrote the, uh, the Ducks, Geese, and Swans of North America, which is kind of the, the Bible for Ducks, Geese, and Swans in North America. So he, he knew how to name a book. Um, he's also a co-author with uh, Dan Holm, who actually just retired from Illinois DNR of the, the ecology and management of the wood duck, um, kind of kind of the, the catch-all of, of the wood duck. Uh, Frank was instrumental in many of the, the lead shot studies. So in his uh, kind of explorations, he, he found um, 
a, a lot of birds dying off, especially in the spring. And so he started started doing some research to try to figure out why, and it was because of lead shot. And so that that work took many years to come to fruition. I think they started uh, in parts in the in the sixties, um, and ultimately that work and and work from other labs led to the lead shot ban in nineteen ninety two. It's the reason that waterfowl hunters cannot use lead shot to this day. Um, another another uh, director was uh, Steve Havera, and Steve um, Steve was a part of that research as well. Steve took over the lab right after Frank. Um, he's kind of a local boy for us. He's he's one of the one of the direct one of the former directors that actually grew up in uh, that part of the world. Frank being the only other one. Um, Steve is still around. He's still very heavily involved in wetland conservation throughout the state. Um, he pokes his head. He likes to say he works part time, but really we see him about five or six times a year. But his part time, he says half time. Uh, Steve wrote the the Waterfowl of Illinois book. Um, it's a very important book uh, that talks about waterfowl conservation history in Illinois and, and waterfowl hunting traditions in Illinois. Um, we've had a couple of directors since then. Uh, Dr. Josh Stafford, who's currently uh, the co-op leader at South Dakota State, and Dr. Heath Hagee, um, who actually hired me back in 2013, who's a uh, waterfowl ecologist for the Southeast region of Fish and Wildlife Service. But this is the staff as it cur currently sits today. So we try to keep about five full-time staff um, just because that seems to be our workload and kind of kind of where our sweet spot is for getting everything done. So the, the beard, red bearded gentleman there is, is Theron Bradshaw. He's in charge of our uh, WRP monitoring, so wetland easement monitoring project. He's also in charge of some, some really cool ARU uh, data that, that I'll talk about in a little while. Um, and, and he, he kind of helps out uh, around the lab with a little bit of everything. We, we really all do. It's really collaborative collegial environment. Uh, Dr. Ariel Fernier um, is immediately to, to his left there. Uh, Dr. Fernier came to us about four years ago from the University of Arkansas. Uh, she is a rail specialist. Uh, people from all over the country call her to ask her rail questions. Uh, she did her PH, PhD work down in the Boot Hill of Missouri, um, and she's got some really cool projects. Hopefully, I'll have enough time to get some of the, to some of the projects that she has outside of Illinois as well. Mindy Lowers is next to her. Mindy's uh, our administrative administrative person. Mindy makes sure the bills are paid on time and makes sure that we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. Um, nothing we would get absolutely nothing accomplished without Mindy. Like she, she's the the glue that holds us all together. Uh, Chelsea Cross is uh, next to her. We actually don't have Chelsea anymore. She left us about two weeks ago. Um, she was our quantitative ecologist, and she works for the Fish and Wildlife Service now, teaching their staff how to do uh, analyses. Uh, so it was it was real sad to see her go. That handsome devil to her left is me. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, the the waterfowl uh, kind of trapper, I guess. I, I'm in charge of most trapping efforts. I'm in charge of the aerial inventories that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, I'm in charge of uh, all the permitting. I'm the master permit holder. Uh, I hold all of our Fish and Wildlife Service permits for collecting birds and doing different things to birds, as well as our uh, state permits also. Um, and on top of that, the facilities manager. It's quite the job. Uh, Andy Gilbert is immediately next to me. Andy leads our uh, Immaquan Preserve Project. So Andy works with the Nature Conservancy. He was actually out all day today cover mapping, looking at vegetation communities and stuff. On top of that, Andy helps out with, with a lot of the waterfowl trapping and, and most of everything that we do around the lab also. So before, I, I know there was some interest in, in uh, the towers and the rail project that we had going on, and I kind of wanted to, to highlight that. But before I go into that, I kind of want to give like a really brief overview of a lot of the projects that we have going on in Illinois right now. And I'll try to be as brief as possible with these, um, just so I have a little bit more time to talk about the rail specific project uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, the aerial inventories, I'm always going to include this one first because it's it's kind of what we're known, known for at the Forbes Lab. Um, we've been conducting aerial surveys of the Illinois and Mississippi rivers since uh, 1948. It's something that Frank started. Uh, we, so this, this will actually be the 75th year of the survey. 
Um, we fly in the fall, usually from, from early September until the, the first week of January, every week, uh, 212 miles of the Illinois River and 214 miles of the Mississippi River, counting waterfowl, swans, cormorants, eagles, uh, geese, pretty much anything big enough that we can tell what it is. Uh, we do the same thing in the spring, except in the spring we count every little piece of water, backwater lake that we can. In the fall, we only count refuges because that's where most of the birds are push, push, pushed to because of hunting activity. Um, and for these, it's as you can imagine, it's long days, it's drawn out, and it, it can get somewhat taxing. On top of that, um, in 2016, uh, we wanted to see if we could start doing shorebird surveys also. So that's something that we've continued to this day. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult, um, especially when they're in kind of standing water, standing vegetation. But when we have good drawdown years like we do now, when there's a lot of mud out there, we can really get a really good count on these shorebirds. Um, we can only tell big, bigs and littles. That's what we call them. So anything bigger than a killdeer is big and anything smaller than that is little. But it is a really good index of, of how the migration is progressing through our areas. And you can see that we do that in both fall and spring also. This is kind of the area that we cover. And this that track, if you can see, is kind of what it looks like. So it's a lot of low flying, low flash, low fast flying, a lot of turns, and it, it takes takes a pretty strong stomach. So we're we're also um, heavily involved in diving duck research. So we, we've, we've had a, an ongoing diving duck monitoring program since 2012. That started with this banding program that you see here. As many of you probably know, lesser scop are not doing that that well. And there's several reasons for that. Um, but we, we uh, kind of morphed this banding project into a large scale Midwest diving duck project where we looked at diets and body condition, food availability, uh, blood metabolite levels to see if they're actually putting on fat or burning fat during the spring migration um, and, and a number of different things, and including an intestinal parasite project. And that's something that we still have going to this day. So uh, there's during the spring, late in the spring migration, there's a there's a, a large die off of lesser scop almost every year on the upper Mississippi River. And we think a part of that is uh, intestinal parasites that these birds get thanks to an invasive snail, the faucet snail, uh, or actually multiple snails. And so we we had a project that mapped the intestinal um, kind of biome, looked at that, that community, that parasite community, and then we had Cheyenne Beach to hold some birds captive and dose them with known amounts of this parasite to see if if not only are there lethal effects, but there's sublethal effects too. So are these birds that aren't dying being impacted enough that they're not successfully reproducing when they make it up? And it turns out that we think that think that that's a possibility. Cheyenne has actually stayed on as a, as a graduate, as a PhD student. She did that work for her master's. She stayed on as a PhD student. She's currently trying to figure out a way to look at um, if these infections actually um, impact that reproductive success, um, if that can lead to these or be a contributing factor to these scop declines and just how prevalent that these trematodes are in, in the waters of the upper Mississippi River. And so how she's doing that is we're, uh, we, we piloted this study two years ago, or actually last spring, um, where we um, surgically implanted uh, G GPS transmitters on 25 lesser scop. Uh, diving ducks are a little bit different than dabbling ducks in that you can't put a backpack on them because they just don't handle it well, they don't survive. And so in order to track their movements uh, with this, this style of transmitter, you have to surgically in implant these transmitters. And that's what the bird looks like. They actually rec recover quite well. Um, within just a few hours, we were letting these birds go. And you can, if you can see, that's the antenna coming out of the back of the bird there. And so these birds make great movements. These, these are just some of the pathways in the, that very same spring, you know, all the way up into the, into the bush into Northern Canada. 
Um, so it's a, it's a really cool project. We're excited to see what Cheyenne can do once we get, you know, another 100, 150, 200 of these transmitters on birds. So shifting gears, we've got our current project, is, and I alluded to these ARUs that Theron is working with. Um, it's kind of a, a waterfowl response to hunting disturbance. And this is, this is some work that's kind of getting, a, it's kind of a hot topic in the waterfowl literature right now. There's multiple projects in the Southeast looking at this same question. Um, but we're putting transmitters on birds as they arrive in the fall. And then we're setting up these uh, ARU units, which are normally used to capture bird calls, to get population estimates of, of, of birds in different upland environments. We're using these to, to capture gunshots and to measure hunting intensities across the landscape. And hopefully we can overlay that on maps of how these birds are actually moving around and seeing, seeing if there's any trends that we can pick out from that. We're doing this on... Uh, on uh, mallards and green winged teal. Um, and we're using a very similar style transmitter as to that one I just showed you in the, in the scop there, um, but these are on in backpacks. So the way these transmitters work are, are, is on a cellular network plan. So just think exactly how your phone works. It's the same 4G network, 3G network, whatever you have. Um, and so these, these transmitters have a solar panel on the back of them so they can charge an internal battery but they also transmit every three days and upload all of the data that they've collected over that time. And we can go every third day um, online and look at that, that, um, that data. So the Great Lakes Mallard project, um, which I was talking about a little bit at, at dinner, um, it's, it's a similar project in that we're using these same style transmitters, but it's a very different question. So they're, the Great Lakes breeding population of mallards doesn't seem to be doing quite as well as the, the prairie nesters, so the birds in North Dakota, South Dakota, Prairie Canada. Um, we're not really sure why that is. We've got a couple of hypotheses, but um, the Great Lakes states and two uh, Canadian provinces got together and said, well, we need to, we need to look at urban birds and rural birds, um, and we need to take genetic samples to see what, pro what proportion of each population or each, uh, I guess, cadre of birds there has some sort of domestic background um, and we need to monitor their movements. And so what we're finding is uh, a lot of these birds that have a little bit more of uh, domesticated genes, so farm raised genes. So the birds that you would find in parks, um, we have uh, seven or eight transmitters in the greater Chicago metropolitan area, a lot of those birds are much, much more reluctant to make migrational movements. They'll move around, especially during winter, they'll move around to find food up here, but they won't make migrational movements. Uh, and so I think that's something, a couple of the other states are seeing a little bit different results, but on the whole, that's what we're seeing from that project. Uh, we have a, a graduate student at the University of, of Illinois, N Nicole Paterki, and N Nicole is looking at uh, a Canada geese as a potential source for uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And so as a lot of these zoonotic diseases become uh, kind of a hot topic and become important, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of concern uh, in the white-tailed deer community about whether or not chronic wasting disease is gonna become a disease that's passed to humans. And so uh, as, as a way to try to get ahead of that, we try to find things like this to look at, um, are, are these diseases that are diseases or bacteria that are naturally held within some of our wilder populations, is that something that can pass on to humans? And so what uh, Nicole is looking at is she's looking at an, an ag dominated landscape and urban landscapes and rural landscapes to see if uh, the bacteria and these geese and the biome, gut biome of this, these geese are, have this um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and that could be really important for, for a number of reasons for treating different things. One of our uh, projects that we finished in the last couple of years is a post-breeding wood duck project. And so you can see uh, Aaron Yetter, who's currently, he, he just retired a couple of years ago, but this is him putting a, a VHF transmitter on one of our wood ducks. 
And so this is a little bit different style of a transmitter. Obviously, a, it's a different attachment method and that is the necklace, but it's a, a radio transmitter, a, a VHF unit. And so it, it sends out a signal at a certain frequency every so often, and we have to actively track that. So we have to go out with antennas. And a lot of times these antennas are attached to trucks to, to triangulate you know, manually the position of these birds. Um, and you might ask yourself, why would you do this when you have GPS te technology? It's because these transmitters cost $130 a piece. Um, the GPS transmitters are more like $1,300 a piece, which is way cheaper than they were about five years ago. So this is what that data looks like. So we, we trapped these birds and marked them in, in the summer and early fall. And so you'll notice a lot of back and forth trend there, back and forth and back and forth. And what we found was during the day, these birds were using like uh, lotus beds and, and wooded wetlands. You would expect that because they're wood ducks. And at nighttime, they're using more emergent wetlands like cattails and moist soil management units. Um, and so a lot of what that back and forth and back and forth is, if you can see it on this map, is them selecting a spot and just going back and forth from day to night. And if they get pushed off of one site, well, they'll just find two more sites and go back and forth and back and forth. So we actually did put some of the GPS transmitters on wood ducks during that period because we wanted to see where they were going, how long they were hanging out where we were. And what we found is uh, they made very fast, long distance moves. So when, once they left the Illinois River Valley where we were, they weren't stopping and going and stopping and going. They were going to their final destination for the most part. Um, so uh, most of our birds departed in late October, but we actually did have some that stayed until I think December 10th or the 12th was our latest departure date, which really surprised a lot of us because we had a lot of ice at that time. Uh, the longest flight that we had there was was from Kilburn, Illinois uh, to Texarkana, which took a, a little under 12 hours, and that was one, one fell swoop. But very impressive what these birds can do, and we're very happy that the technology has gotten to where it is so we can track these movements. So I'll talk a bit, little bit about our Imaquan Preserve project. So this is something that I led for a couple of years and now Andy's in charge of. Um, Imaquan Preserve is a Nature Conservancy owned project. It was restored in 2007. So basically they just um, bought this old floodplain wetland that had been row cropped since the early 1900s, turned the pumps off and let everything come back and boy, did it ever. Um, this is this is what it looks like currently. It's, it's the water is a little bit lower because I've got a good handle on the water control in there now. Um, but it's, uh, I'm sure most of you guys have probably been there. Um, it's, it's phenomenal bird habitat um, for just a, just a varied suite of birds. Um, this is kind of, this is what it looks like now and hopefully what it looks like in just a couple of weeks. Um, we have, so we, we monitor things like the waterfowl migrations, the shorebird migrations there, Andy maps, uh, vegetation, uh, structure and communities there. Um, we've been doing some uh, some food sampling over the course of the project. So these are all long-term data sets, which is which is really cool for such a large property to have all of this kind of continuous data over time. Um, one of the cooler things that we're uh, that we're doing there is. Uh, we have a nesting water bird uh, project where we bring in interns or technicians during the summer and they're able to spend uh, spend the summer in the marsh finding, monitoring uh, nests for things like coots and gallinules and least bitterns and those types of birds. So it's a, it's a really cool way for us to get uh, the younger generation of biologists in and get them some experience. So on to the to what you guys all wanted to hear about what was most, I guess, um, um, asked about is our, our rail ecology project. So um, we started a banding uh, program for, for rails, for SORAs and Virginia rails um, in 2020, 2019, 2020. Um, and we're continuing that till this to this day. So the project specifically that I'll talk about is Chad Kramer's project, who's a graduate student right now at the University of Illinois. Um, Chad's looking specifically at stopover duration and uh, and kind of activities of soar in Virginia rail during the spring in our area. 
So I don't have to tell you guys uh, that much about these rails. I'm sure you already know. Um, they're very small secretive marsh birds. Uh, they love dense emergent uh, cover, especially hemi marsh cattails. Uh, and they are secretive marsh birds, which makes it difficult for us to get an idea of where they are, uh, to, to monitor their population, to even know anything about their population. There's very little that we know about rails in general. Um, and even less about Sora and Virginia rails. Um, migration for these birds and most other birds is the most stressful part of their life cycle. Um, in central Illinois, we're supposed to be providing quality stopover habitat. Um, they're supposed to be stopping here to refuel and then successfully make it to the breeding grounds and successfully reproduce. That's our little niche in their whole life cycle. Um, if they're not getting what they need at our stopover site, that has potential carryover effects. So they, if they show up to the breeding grounds in poor body condition, chances are they're not going to make more of those cute little, you know, fluffs of chicks. Um, but like I mentioned before, um, information is lacking on this bird, especially spring spring migration um, information. Um, Waterfowl is one of the most studied critters on the planet, especially the mallard. And that's a species that we still don't have a ton of information on spring migration. So you can only imagine a, a species like Sora or Virginia rail, how little we have on them. So that's kind of what we wanted to look at with this project. We wanted to look at what they're doing while, while they're here, how long they stay here, and can we kind of determine whether or not they're getting what they need. We also wanted to, to look at migratory pathways and whether or not they're, they're coming down, making the fall migration on the, along the same route as they make the spring, or if there's a different route. And so automated telemetry is a, is a heck of a way to do this. Um, I'm sure uh, any, any one of you that have been down to Banner Marsh or Imaquan Preserve in the last couple of years have, have seen these massive towers with antennas across the top of them. So basically what that is, is a more passive way to collect data from these transmitters that we put on these birds. The transmitters that we're putting on these birds, and I'll show you a picture of them in just a second, are, are very similar to those wood duck transmitters um, in that they emit a radio signal every few seconds. And so what these uh, towers do, they, they're called modus towers, is they collect, they receive that information and say, yes, that bird was here. Um, it's, it's a little more touch and go than the GPS transmitters, but we'll take it considering how little that we know. So our questions for this project specifically, I'm, I probably already said this, but I'll, I'll beat it to death. I'll go ahead and do that. When are Sora and Virginia Rail stopping over in central Illinois? So when are they getting here in the spring? Uh, how long is that stop over? Uh, what factors might influence them from finally leaving in the spring? Um, and can we can we determine what they're doing when they're here? And can um, this modus network of towers, because we're not the only ones that put these towers up, can this network provide information on larger scale movements and where these birds are going? And so our study sites were on Imaquan Preserve and on Banner Marsh State Fish and Wildlife Area. Both are, are, are suitable or, or seem to be suitable habitat. Uh, this project hopefully will, will tell us whether or not they are suitable. And this is how we trap them. So we started trapping mid-March um, and, and ended in, in mid to late May. Um, over the course of the three years, we caught 5, 557 rails um, and, and banded all of those, uh, 395 Virginia and 162 Sora. Um, we use this trap here, which you may have seen out in the field if you were down there. Um, it's it's um, an audio lure trap. So that big panel there is a solar panel that goes down to a, to a box, um, a battery box that keeps the battery going that plays uh, uh, kind of a loop of Sora, Virginia and other marsh bird calls to try to lure these birds to this area. And if you could tell here, this little walk-in confusion trap, there's the walk-in area. So they bounce around this black box here until they find this hole. Hopefully they go in the trap Try to figure out a way out. They walk up this little panel or this little elevator here and fall into our catch trap where we can come and catch them and band them and measure them and weigh them and do all the things that we do. And there's one of, uh, that's the first sore I ever captured out there. Um, 
so we wanted to get an idea of when the birds were here, um, like peak, peak migration of, of soar in Virginia through, through their time in central Illinois. Um, so as a way to do that, we just kind of kind of marked uh, the captures per trap effort, which all that is is a measure of, of, of captures because we had more traps out one day than we had another day. We kind of had to standardize it and that's the way we did it. So this is just the number of captures and this is the day through the year. So the red is 2021, the green is 2022, and the blue is 2023. And so red actually turned out to be kind of a, a typical um, idea, more ideal spring. And you can kind of see how um, we peaked around mid, mid April for both species. Um, 2022 was a little bit more um, delayed. So we, we had a longer winter um, and you can see how that followed there. And 2023, we warmed up quick, we had a cold snap and then uh, we warmed back up. And so that's what this little plateau here is on the Virginia rail. We actually caught quite a few Virginia rail. And then we had that cold snap and we couldn't catch anything, but the birds were still hanging out. And then um, we, we kept catching them after after the warm up. So this is just a way to to try to try to map that peak migration period and match it to the to the spring conditions on the ground. Um, this these are the towers and the transmitters I was talking about. So that uh, that tower has you know two sets of antennas, one on the top there, and one so they're multi directional antennas. Um, the VHF nanotags, we attach we attach those, it's called a leg loop system. And it's basically like a neat little belt that we put on these birds and stick that antenna straight up. It's very important, especially for these marsh birds for that antenna to be sticking straight up because it's reception is pretty difficult in cattail and emergent marsh. Mm -hmm. um, and so overall we deployed 188 tags, um, 68 on Sora and 120 on Virginia rails. So as scientists, we like to look at the data and make these cool little plots before we start doing any sort of analyses, right? And so all this is, is telling you exact, this little box and whisker plot is just telling you exactly what I just told you in that other graph. So in 2021, um, we, we wanted to look at, this box plot specifically is answering that stopover duration question, which turns out for both species is around nine to 14 days um, in our area. So in 2021, ideal conditions that, you know, everything is kind of together. There's, there's no outliers. Everything looks pretty good. In 2022, that was the year, um, that was the year that we actually caught a few birds. It, it turned off cool. And then we started catching them again. In 2023, 2023, it kind of condensed again. It was just a little bit later in the season. And so departures ever after civil twilight, that's just when these birds were leaving. We know that they migrate at night, but we didn't know exactly when at night. And it turns out anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half after, after twilight is when these birds are making their decision to leave. And that, go, that went for across the board across all three years. So some interesting notes that we found, um, rails, we're, we're choosing these clear nights, um, nothing surprising there, that's what birds do, but they were also choosing darker nights. So dark, so nights when the moon phase wasn't so great. Um, and so what we think is happening there is it's darker, it gives them a lo little better view of the stars, maybe some navigational kind of cues. Um, and it also could be a, a predator avoidance thing. We also found that rails tended to wait a little bit more um, than some other species for profitable winds or for favorable winds to leave. Um, and so we really, we started seeing some really cool data where these birds would actually increase their activity at night. And uh, what we think they were doing was going up and sampling the environment to see if the wind was favorable for them to go. They had that hard, hard south wind so they could head north. And um, a lot of the birds, if it was a south, uh, a north wind night, or the wind just wasn't favorable at all, we were finding that they were hanging out until they actually had clear nights, dark nights, and a north wind. 
Um, we did see a negative relationship with with rain during the day daytime activities, which was was it's kind of intuitive. You you would expect that you would expect rails to kind of sit tight, uh, but that's just something that's never been explored or even written in the literature. Um, in the daytime, as the season progressed, um, soras especially seemed to increase their activity, so they moved around a lot on our landscape during the day, which was pretty cool. Probably. Uh, feeding activities or any number of things, searching for mates. Um, and at nighttime, like I said before, um, that kind of sampling flights for departure. So sometimes at night they would increase their activity. So I talked a little bit about those modus towers and the, the fact that we only, we're not the only ones that have them. In fact, we only have six um, in, on, in our possession, I guess I can say. This is what that modus tower network looks like across the country. Um, you can see that the Northeast especially has a ton of coverage, but as you get further West, um, there's, there's not a lot of coverage and that becomes important in just a second. Um, but a lot of these modus towers, especially around Lake Ontario, they're just kind of bunched together and they, they've got some really spectacular data on a number of species. Um, we're actually collaborating with another uh, another researcher at the University of Illinois to do some uh, saw wet owl stuff. We're going to try to put all of our towers kind of on the north border of Illinois to see if we can determine whether or not saw wet owls are migrating. Um, and that's hopefully that's coming in the next year. But this is what some of our rails were doing. So uh, Soras especially were making this strong northwest movement. And we had a couple that made a northeast movement, but only only one really. Um, and it's kind of why I brought up so many towers to the northeast because it's not like one of these birds would have made a movement over there and wouldn't have been detected because there's so darn many of those towers over there. If one of these birds moved over there, it was going to get detected. Um, but it appears that most of our birds are heading up. We don't quite know how far north they go, um, but a couple of these birds made their way up into Manitoba. And then you kind of see that more of a loop or elliptical migration coming back down. So that orange is in the fall right there. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Virginias did. They followed a very similar path, except for that one crazy dude that hung out in Saskatchewan and then just felt like he wanted to go down to the coast for a little while. Um, that, that bird took seven days to get from um, from our neck of the woods up and up to Saskatchewan, and then from Kansas, where it stopped over for a couple of days, down to the coast. It took 21 days. So that kind of shows you how that the the spring migration is much much quicker, and the fall migration is you know we're just gonna peter potter around and look for food and stuff. So just to kind of bring this all together, um, we think migration for these two species of rails peaks in our area about mid to late April. Um, stopover is about nine to 14 days, which we think uh, tells us that, that our stopover conditions are what they need. It's meeting, meeting their energetic needs and hopefully they're arriving on their breeding grounds and breeding successfully. Um, they like dark, clear nights and they like favorable winds just like most other bird species do. Their activities during the day increase and their activities at night increase when they're trying to get out of dodge. Um, the majority of, of our detections of birds that leave our area are occurring northwest of central Illinois, probably going up to that prairie pothole region um, and hopefully some, some productive wetlands up there. And, and we have, you know, not a lot of data, but some, some data that are telling us that the migratory pathways may be a little bit different in the fall. Now that could be for any number of reasons. It could be for habitat conditions, or it could just be that the wind patterns are a little bit different, you know, during the fall than they are spring. Um, that's pretty much all I have on that. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have. You're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> but if you guys are interested, I can, I can give you a brief overlook of a couple of our projects that are not happening in Illinois. So Dr. Furnier would love me for this because these, these are her babies. Yeah. Um, so we have, it's, uh, it's called the Firebird Project. This is something that Dr. Furnier um, kind of, uh, she, she got on, she got this project on the, on the road before she ever hired on with us. 
so she did her she did a postdoc um, internship with uh, Mississippi State University, and she collaborated with five different states and multiple tons of people down there, and they wanted to look at um, fire response in coastal marshes and look at if that impacts uh, black rails, yellow rails, and model ducks. So they're specifically looking at distribution and abundance of black, yellows, and model ducks. They're mapping this high marsh habitat, which is a habitat that is kind of going away that these birds really rely on. Um, and they're mapping their movements and, and how fire on the landscape, which is a imp very important part of that landscape, um, how, how that's impacting these birds. Um, and th they've done a bunch of work already uh, determining if the weather, um, the weather patterns are precluding them or keeping them from being able to put fire on the landscape to maintain these habitats. It's a really cool project across five states in the, in the Gulf Coast region. Um, and it's, it's something that hopefully leads to the protection of, of the black rails um, and the model ducks and that habitat down there. Uh, we also have a Colorado Black Rail graduate student. So Nora Hargett, she's another University of Illinois student. She's someone that worked as a technician for us on, on an Imaquan project, a lease bittern project we had a number of years ago. So uh, Nora is a rock star. Hopefully um, you guys will hear more about her stuff in the future because we're trying to save this specific area and this sp specific bird. Um, but Black Rails do occur in Colorado in this very unique kind of desert habitat over there, um, higher densities than anywhere in North America that we that we found them. It's really, really cool. Um, Nora is working specifically using ARUs and using cameras and a number of things to see if, if there's a way we can estimate how many there actually are in that area and if we can get some sort of population estimate and what habitat specifically are they using over there. It's a really cool project. I think she actually just finished up her last field season over there. And we have Jess Schmidt, who's another one of our former technicians, and she's working on King Rails in Arkansas. Um, there's there's one site. It's the Choctaw um, State Fish and Wildlife Area down there. I think it's Choctaw Wildlife, whatever, Wildlife Management Area, whatever they call their state areas down there. But it's the only site in Arkansas that has consistent uh, King Rails. Um, so in, in, in an ad dominated landscape and in a, um, like they are down there, uh, that we're trying to look at what role that site is playing, um, in a, in a larger scale picture. So are these birds moving from that area in Arkansas down to Louisiana where there's much more of this habitat or are they just staying right there? And it's, we're kind of seeing that it's a little bit of both. And so she caught these birds using traps. She had a ton of success. And I don't want to I don't want to butcher how many transmitters she put out, but it's it's a lot, um, or a lot for, you know, a lot more than you would expect for a king rail. Um, and she was able to to find some nest and see some some success and reproduction on that specific area. And that's pretty much it. I don't want to go into that. Um, I'm I'm glad to take any questions about any of that stuff or the area in general. Um, we're very proud of the area uh, that we work in. You know, we're, we're fortunate to have Chautauqua National Wildlife Ref Refuge right there, the Imaquan Preserve, the Imaquan Refuge, and all the state fish and wildlife um, wetlands around us. It's kind of a unique oasis in the middle of the corn desert up there, for sure. Josh, why don't you share your sure. screen here and... Uh... <clears throat> and so we'll start with our... Our studio audience, any questions for Josh here? And those of you at home, if you have a question, please just type it into the chat and uh, we'll capture that and offer it up to Josh here. So, I have a visited. Where do, where do I access? Access. The Emaquan. So um, Emaquan is in Lewiston, Illinois. So it's it's just across the river from Chautauqua National Wildlife Refuge. If you've been there, um, I can I can get you directions or a waypoint or something. But it's it's a pretty spectacular area. I think. Yeah, Lewiston. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Just south of Peoria. 
Josh, I, I was just mentioned that I was down there and um, the Amaquan looked like it was all grassed over. Couldn't sign. And is that typical for for this time of year? Yeah, so they've done, uh, they had a number of high water years um, back from 2015 to 2016, 17. And they were, they were that, that levy specifically was never meant to hold water back from the river. It was meant to hold the river out from the inside. Um, and so they started seeing some levee damage and, and um, in a, in a large scale wetland like that, you want to do, um, periodic drawdowns anyway. So draw some of the water out of there to kind of reset the wetland cycle. Um, and so that's what they've done. They've, they've spent a number, a number of years drawing down, I think from 2017 to about 2019, um, they worked on drawing the, the river level down to reset the, the cycle. Um, currently right now, they're hoping to get water back on to bring on more submerged aquatic plants. Um, but they're fighting a little bit of a common carp problem, which is kind of unique to most of the river valley. Uh, everybody else is fighting invasive carp problems, and we're fighting, or Emiquan's fighting a little bit of both, kind of, but more so the common carp that's causing the problem in there. But yeah, it is a little bit more grassy than it has been yeah. in the okay. in previous Sir, period. did you have a question? Yes, in the beginning of your lecture, you were talking about the lead shot. How did this first occur? Was it they eating it or they... yeah, the, the yeah. Qu question was about lead shot and how does that affect birds yeah. um so it's a, a little bit of eating it but also a little bit of birds that were getting shot but not killed um probably more so the birds eating it so when they when they started um they started assuming that that was the problem or hypothesizing that that was the problem. What what Frank and, and the other folks at the lab did was they would hold birds captive and then dose them with a, with a certain amount of lead shot and see how they responded. And so what they were finding is they were killing a lot of birds. Um, and so they, they went through multiple iterations of that. They would inject, um, inject the breast of birds with a, a couple of lead pellets and those sorts of things. So there was it was a long term study that they looked at a number of different things, but for the most part, um, you, you know, you, you can pick up emptied holes, emptied shotgun holes after you shoot, but you can't go out there and pick up the spent shot, you know. And there's, you know, who knows how many of those. So I think the the question is, what were they what are they using now instead of lead? So and I think that I think that regulation was passed in ninety two. And so there's been been a, a steel shot, kind of the the go-to for most people. Um, as technologies have advanced in the the last, I would say five years or so, folks are starting to use things like tungsten and bismuth, which is any non-toxic metal that you can use um, in a in a shotgun shot. You know, and tungsten and bismuth is a little bit more expensive than steel, so I don't think steel is ever going away, but um, it's a combination of those three. Sure. So the question is, is the lead shot banned? Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's a federal ban. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so, so lead shot is banned. I'm sorry. I should have been a little bit more clear. Lead shot is banned for waterfowl hunting because that occurs over the water and that's where these birds are feeding. So it's banning lead shot um, for say dove hunting or pheasant hunting or those types of things is starting to gain some ground. Um, it, but it's still just one of those things that's mostly, uh, mostly encouraged in a lot of states. That's right. That's right. But that, that's more of, um, that's more of rifle, rifle hunting. So, um, you know, the eagle eats the carrion of, of, you know, a, a crippled deer or something, and it's got lead shot from a spent slug in it or something. That's more where that comes from. Related to lead, Angel was asking about a fishing gear made of lead. Is there any 
Fishing gear made of made of lead. No, so um, that's kind of a um, a touchy subject for a lot of folks. Um, I I know the the Fish and Wildlife Service had looked at banning lead weights. I'm not sure where they stand on that right now, but I know that's been a topic of some contention for the last. Yeah. Well, the thing about the thing about fishing weights is that typically they're not hundreds of thousands of spent fishing weights, you know, and in small enough pieces for the birds to ingest them, right? So it's it's a little bit less of a problem, but it's still something that is highly contested. <laughs> and another question from our Zoomers about the distance that can detect uh, the modus uh, antennas can detect a bird with a... Sure, so it, it varies based on where where you are. Um, we've had some really good luck. I, I think we kind of assumed about a mile out in either direction, but we, we're getting even further detections than that. And so that, that's why, you know, when I was talking about that uh, saw wet owl project that we're hoping to collaborate on, stretching our towers and combining those with a couple of more towers across the northern uh, the northern border of Illinois. Hopefully that's something that we we can set them up in a way that we know for sure, okay, these birds are moving. Steve, anything else from our Zoom audience, our studio audience? Yes, sir. Do you have any idea where the locations in Colorado are or black rails concentrate? I should, but I I I, I don't remember right now. Um, I actually just talked to Nora not too long ago. Um, but it's it's southwest Colorado. So it's it, um, if you know anything or if you, I guess if you've been to that part of Colorado, you know, it looks a lot more like western Kansas than it does Colorado. It's not the um, mountainous kind of thing when you think of when you think of Colorado, but it's in the southwest corner of Colorado. And it's on a it's on Colorado, Colorado. Uh, fish and wildlife ground, so it's on state managed ground. Did, did I see a hand over here? Do you ever collect those monitors back? So the question is, do we ever collect the, the monitors back? Um, on on waterfowl, yeah, They're yes. Expensive. Yeah, so on waterfowl we do, we try to with, like with Jess Schmidt's project, so the project in Arkansas, she's using similar uh, GSM transmitters, um, and we try to get those when we can. So basically what happens when one of those fall off, it falls off is as long as it's still um, in an area that it can transmit, it'll just keep transmitting data. And so you'll have a really good idea because you'll have 50, 100 points where that bird dropped it or where that bird died or whatever. And so you can just go to that location and look around. Um, that's a lot easier for ducks um, for, for whatever reason, I think part of it's because it's a bigger transmitter, but part of it is um, a lot of these birds get harvested by hunters. And so our, my, my name, our name and information is on there and they contact us and um, we can send them a replica so they have something to remember it by and they'll send us that back. It's a lot, it's a lot easier for us to stomach paying $50 for a replica and get you know a $1,500 transmitter back than it is just kind of forgetting about it. But we have had really good luck. The hunters have all been uh, really great in providing those back to us, for sure. Nice. Well, Josh, thank you so much for being here this evening. Enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. We will uh, draw tonight's presentation to a close. Uh, we have on tap next month a presentation about barn owls. So you might be interested in that as well. So until then, see you out on the trails. Happy birding. <laughs>